Hello to all of our working preachers. This is Matt Skinner. Our fall campaign is off to a great start, and I'm grateful for all of you who have stepped up to support this ministry. Your support provides new podcast episodes each week for both narrative and revised common lectionary preachers around the globe. Your gifts make an immediate impact for people at a time when biblical preaching is so desperately needed. As for those of you who have not yet been in touch with us, we need your support during this campaign to ensure that these resources continue to be available uh, for free to all of the preachers who rely upon them. A gift of just $125 covers the cost of a podcast. Any gift to the fall campaign will unlock a free book titled Youthful Sermons. Go to workingpreacher.org before November 30th, and you'll double your impact and have each gift matched dollar for dollar. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for Reign of Christ or Christ the King or Christ the Monarch Sunday, whatever you want to call it, on November 21st, 2021, uh, are these Daniel 7, 9 through 10 and 13 through 14. I think this is the final semi-continuous first reading, 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 7, Psalm 93, Revelation 1, 4b through 8, and the gospel text is from John chapter 18, 33 through 37. Happy end of year B, fellow podcasters. And also to you. Yeah, so we're, uh, here we are at the end of, at the end of, uh, Year B, Mark, and uh, Reign of Christ, and we get this little section in the Gospel of John, where uh, John focuses on uh, this uh, Jesus kingdom, or Jesus as king, and that it's a rather uh, unmentioned reality or description of, of Jesus throughout the Gospel of John, and, and John centers or centralizes this description of Jesus or recognizing Jesus as king or the kingship of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus here in the trial narr narrative, which is, which is an interesting aspect of thinking about the larger framework of what do we mean by calling Jesus king and what do we mean by reign of Christ. And so you certainly have this contrast here between between different kinds of powers. And of course, that's what reign of Christ invites us into is imagining what does Christ, what does Christ's kingdom look like and what does it mean and what does it inaugurate? This is the first interrogation by Pilate in, uh, in John and it's scene two of the trial narrative. So we're, we're rather early on in, in that reality in these, in these interrogations or in this dialogue between Jesus and between Pilate and then of course the the authorities that are outside. And so I, I think one thing that that's important to remember, and I would I would add a verse here because what is truth is of course the one of the famous lines in this particular section of John. And I say add it because it's, I think it's an important question when we think about this Sunday. What is the truth of God's kingdom? What is the truth of, of Jesus' reign? And how is it that we are attentive to that? And how is it that we embody that and live that and 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 are willing to call out those kingdom and kingdoms and those powers that do not have the truth that is Jesus uh, front and center in in. In, in what that means. So some initial thoughts for this Sunday. I think whether it's this text or even several of the other ones, we have to acknowledge and maybe even play around with the idea that Jesus himself seems pretty ambivalent about being called a king. Uh, certainly here, uh, we see this in other gospels as well uh, in their trial scenes in particular, but also earlier in John when people want to make him king and he runs away from that. Caroline, what chapter is that? Wait, what? What chapter in John is that? Where Jesus... Where they want to force him to become king, and he, he rejects this. Oh, uh, where is that? 
Ah, it's um, earlier than John though, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, yeah. just making sure everybody's awake here. I uh, the King Sunday. Uh, that there's an ambivalence. I got a little distracted there. <laughs> there's an ambivalence around the title. And then there's also, of course, all four gospels agree, although the wording is different in each of them, that he's crucified as a king. That's the sign that's placed over him uh, sarcastically, right? In a sense of mockery, in a sense of further humiliating, not just him, but really the Jewish people and the hope for, for kingship or the hope for Jewish autonomy and restoration that Rome is just is laughing at. So, I mean, we have to, I think, kind of play around with the, the, the kind of almost street theater-ish, right? The kind of burlesque that surrounds the title as well, that sure, Jesus can take that title, that title can be applied to him, but you're going to have to nuance it. You're going to have to upside down it um, because what we've seen or what we understand kings to be or power to look like uh, doesn't exactly fit. And in some ways, this passage gets at that with my kingdom is not from here. It's not that he's saying, I live in heaven, you live here. It's it's my kingdom is not like this. My kingdom is utterly unrecognizable to somebody like you, Pilate, in the way you understand power and privilege and um, and what the future looks like or what security looks like. I find that particularly uh, challenging for us because the place of security, uh, the place, uh, the place of security, and the place of power um, is in empire, and uh, we continue to. Um, we don't call ourselves kingdoms, uh, at least uh, not in North America, but we still um, look to uh, power and security. And uh, what Jesus is basically pointing to is that that source of hope, that source of promise, uh, that source of uh, security um, comes not from uh, the what we build up, but what the Creator has promised. And uh, it's it's disconcerting to take that position, especially now when we seem to be in a cultural moment where we're all fighting to figure out who's ruler. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, earthly ruler is the one that is the most trustworthy. I think, too, the connection to what you pointed out, Matt, uh, that my kingdom is not from this world, is a particularly in John, a connection back to uh, the beginning of the gospel. And where does Jesus come from? Jesus comes from God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so you have Jesus coming from, Jesus' origin is from a time that is not time. It's a temporal. It's, and, and yet Jesus then, the word made flesh enters into time. But it's for the sake of the, God's love for the world. And so I, I, that's also, I think, uh, an important aspect of what we're getting here in the Gospel of John, of recognizing, recognizing that uh, this, this kingdom that, that Jesus represents or this kingdom that Jesus is about uh, is it, we, try to, we try to locate it or we try to describe it in such a way that, that you were saying, Joy, around certain aspects of how we perceive power and empire. And yet, and yet we're reminded it, with the reference to the world that this is, this is uh, not about, uh, not about that, but, but, uh, but about a, a kind of new creation, really a kind of uh, recreation of the world, but for the sake of the way in which God's love changes the world. And so that could be, I think, another theme that, that a preacher could take with regard to how is this, how is this kingdom recognized and what, what, what aspects about who God is and what God is about are the criteria for, uh, for that recognition. I thank, I appreciate that, uh, Caroline. Um, and it made me recognize um, uh, the verse, uh, uh, what is it, 35, um, your own nation and the chief priests. Uh, so your people and your leaders, um, have handed you over to me. 
Um, and if, if we take this idea uh, and play with it that you're pushing uh, in terms of recognizing new creation, uh, God's creation, uh, God's intent for, um, the, for reality, um, and yet we have, um, uh, we have given it to the systems of this world. Um, um, so we have this ultimate promise of uh, a, a peace that is beyond our understanding, a justice that is um, that no government has ever offered. And we reduce it by saying, let's put it under um, uh, the earthly rulers. Um, and that's just uh, a, a different kind of slant of reading uh, that, that uh, second portion of uh, verse 35. I have, uh, for, for uh, the New Testament experts who know Greek a lot better than I do, I have two questions uh, about this. So I'm setting you up, um, uh, Caroline so, uh, and Matt. So the first one is, my kingdom is not from here. I think I'm used, to, the older translations still ring. And it, 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 that's one word. Um, I'm not even going to pronounce it but, uh okay i am too uh, and tooth and that i i'm used to older translations that do something more like my my kingdom is not of this side or something um what is <clears throat> say more about that what verse are we talking about sorry 1836 verse Oh, 36. Okay. The NRSV says, my kingdom is not from here. And I just was um, wondering if you guys could expand on that a little bit. Well, it's, uh, it's literally in the Greek, my kingdom is not from um, this world. So it's, that's the, that's what I'm seeing. How about you, Matt? He says it twice. He starts off, yep. my kingdom is not from this world. And he says, my kingdom is not from this place. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. From this place, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's the question of what is what's the world in John, and what's he talking about here? And it, so it's often been translated as a kind of not translated. It's often been understood as Jesus saying, "I'm not an earthly king. I'm a heavenly king, or I belong somewhere else." And it's, I, I think, a better way. This isn't so much the grammar of the sentence. This is an understanding of what does cosmos mean. Um, in in John as a whole, that Jesus is saying, my my kingdom's not not this type. My kingdom's not like this. My kingdom's not what you'd understand to be familiar. Right? If it was, my followers would be fighting to keep it because that's how you keep a kingdom in this world through intimidation, domination, force, threat, strength. You know, but it's, that's really helpful. So he's uh, saying, yeah, it's just a different quality. So then the next thing is um, towards the end of verse thirty-seven. Uh, um, the NRSV says, everyone who belongs to the truth. I'm just seeing the verb of being, everyone who is of the truth, um, which then leads to, if truth is a person, Jesus, how does that change? Uh, I think it really changes how I think about faith. If um, truth isn't propositional only, but tr truth is relational, that truth is a person namely um, Jesus, whose reign is hidden. Mm -hmm. Well, and here the, yeah, the, the truth is, I, this is going back to John 14, right? I am the way, the truth and the life. And when in that initial, in, in your initial question and, and Matt's at answer with regard to my kingdom is not like this or my kingdom uh, is not of this place what i think one theme that is hovering in the background in all of this is the assumption of the ascension so that that jesus is jesus is jesus kingdom or jesus realm if you will is again outside of time and place because it's a relational reality that that jesus will make sure that it is continued for his followers uh, after the ascension. I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God and preparing this abiding place for you. 
But the other, the other thing that you get here that emphasizes that, that everyone who belongs to the truth or every, anyone who is from the truth listens to my voice, of course, that goes back to, that harkens back to the uh, John 10 and my sheep know my voice, my sheep hear my voice. And then, and, and John 11 of Lazarus coming out because he hears out of the tomb because he hears Jesus' voice. And then Mary's recognition, fast forwarding to John 20, Mary's recognition of Jesus in the garden will be because, uh, because of uh, hearing his voice, but also her name being called. So there's a lot of Johannine themes here with regard to that kingdom, again, is not about structures and about power and about, but it's, it's, it's a kingdom that's defined by relationship and, and a relationship with, with the good shepherd. And that's a, of course, a very different, uh, very different otherworldly other kind of way of describing what reign or kingdom looks like uh, when powers and empires really don't care a whole lot about maintaining relationships. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struck this, this year in this text, I'm struck by the reality about how we have uh, all these truth commissions in our society and government that investigate things that happened on January 6th or other things. And those, uh, those um, government truth commissions are not about finding the truth. No matter who's in power, they're about finding the truth that fits their claims on power and presenting it in a way that will perpetuate their power. And this, it just, maybe that's an angle in for me about thinking about what it means to um, have a ki uh, king who is truth and that relationship is truth. Well, we really need to move on. Um, the, uh, the other texts, it seems to me, all, um, shed light on on the main the main text in different ways um one thing about the psalm uh beth tanner does a characteristically uh good job with the commentary uh this is one of the enthronement psalms uh which are packed in the 90s um so one thing about that and they all say uh, the lord is king yahweh is king yahweh reigns uh this one does it right in verse one and um, in, the, uh, in the arrangement of the Psalms in the Psalter, they all come after Psalm 89, which declares the failure of the Davidic monarchy. So in Psalm 89, the Davidic monarchy is, uh, that covenant fails because of the human kings. And then these all respond and say, yeah, but there's a different kind of king, Yahweh. If we lean into um, the, the fact that uh, each of these uh, texts uh, center around this, um, I, how appropriate for Christ the King, uh, I think um, about uh, how um, our understanding of government, again, in North America, is not of a kingdom. And so we often talk about this world and the other world. Um, um, one of the things that struck me when uh, we were introduced to the ministries in the Harry Potter series was the fact that uh, that's how government in um, England uh, is described. And so that made a whole lot of sense in the imagination of children in England. It was an introduction for children in North America. And um, what begins to happen is this same idea for us. When we stop thinking about this in simply uh, the literal sense of a kingdom and begin to think about this in the way of who is it, and I'm looking at the line in, um, in Daniel uh, that says that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And so um, it, it's a shift away from um, uh, the Johannine way of talking about the shepherd and uh, the one who cares for us and what is our response. And the response is that across the borders that uh, humanity is comfortable with uh, are people who respond to the voice of the true king, the one who is truth. And that service will create a culture, a world, a kingdom that looks like 
the place of righteousness, the place of justice, the place of relationship where everyone belongs. And, um, so I, I really appreciate that uh, kind of leaning together of these texts uh, this week. I'm going to confess that I find the text like a really confused in, in terms of, of how they fit together, which, you know, is, I find the Bible really confused in terms of how it fits <laughs> together. So that's, I'm okay with that. I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, it seems to me that John's gospel does the best at trying to kind of redefine or decenter this notion of Jesus as king. Um, interestingly enough, the synoptics all spent a lot of time with Daniel chapter seven, which Daniel chapter seven, this is really, this is really a king who's going to make everybody serve him. Uh, this is really a king who looks like the empire, the emperors, uh, you know, who run the empires. And uh, so that's, I mean, it's just interesting that that's a different kind of mode, a different way of mimicking what kingship looks like. When we get to Revelation, I think we'll see something really different in terms of what Revelation is trying to do to define and redefine this. Yeah, um, can we, let's, so let's, can we go to Revelation? I'm not, well, I'm done. Oh, sorry, I thought you were, <laughs> with, with the, with the Davidic stuff though, I think we get it again. We get this odd mixture of, of this, this odd romantic romanticizing of David's monarchy that, uh, that certainly the Bible remembers him as this great King, but it's really odd to end with, you know, some of the last words of David talking about kingship. I mean, David's one of the last people I want to talk about on Christ the King Sunday, to be honest, um, as kind of a model of kingship or something that we hope Jesus looks like. I get that David becomes a myth in scripture and his kingship becomes mythologized in certain ways. But I just would say that, you know, a, a preacher who wants to do multiple texts this week has got to spend a lot of time with the diversity and the tensions that are here. But go ahead. We all go to Revelation. Well, before we do that, Matt, um, I I I I want to weave that together um, in in the, agreeing with what you're saying for folks to pay attention that um, the language leans uh, in, in on Christ the King Sunday leans to the one who is true truly king not david um and i think it was roth that was saying the the or uh, uh, one one of us just got through saying that uh, what is noted it was roth in talking about the psalm that at 89 it is the clear recognition of the failure of of the the davidic covenant the the kings uh, that israel has taken uh, its pride in and the shift to um, the Lord is King, and I and I would uh, encourage folks to be intentional, like you're saying, Matt. If they're going to try to do all of these verses, to read David's last words as pointing to God as King, and uh, definitely not lingering in anything that would uh, romanticize the kingships of David. I do like how Revelation um, redefines kingship. Um, in a helpful way, and it's one of the one of the reasons I um, I was always confused that the uh, the the hymn of praise in the traditional liturgy, you know, glory and honor and power and might, the Lamb has begun His reign. I was like, why are we singing this every week? It's really weird. Um, then someone helped me understand that it's because look around; it doesn't look like this. Uh, if you look around outside the world, you know, it doesn't look like um, the lamb has begun his reign. Uh, and I really like, uh, and that language, of course, my point is, comes from Revelation. Um, I do like the fact that this, it defines kingship uh, in Revelation as uh, uh, a God who loves us, frees us from sin, um, and uh, has a kingship and reign that's invisible to the ways of the world. Well, and one of the things about Revelation I, I, it, that is particularly with this text, it, and it goes back to some of the themes that we've already named about what, what are we saying of reign of Christ and that the ways in which we focus perhaps on, on what does that king look like or what, what does that kingdom look like, but really what the book of Revelation reminds us, and then Barbara Rossing's commentary is terrific. So I would have people, I would have people read that for sure. 
but this emphasis on on Jesus' presence, on Christ's presence, and when it looks like, I mean, that's one of the one of the things, of course, of apocalyptic, the promise of apocalyptic and the encouragement of apocalyptic literature is that it looks like certain powers are in control. There, there's certain kingdoms that are reigning that seem to have all the power and all of the authority when in fact that is not true. That's the promise of what apocalyptic, uh, of, uh, apocalyptic brings. And so here in, the, in verse four, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's one of my favorite moments in the book of Revelation, uh, a book that is so misinterpreted for predictions of the future and the apocalypse and Armageddon and Bruce Willis is going to save the world and things like that. But, but that, that, that focus on the fact that the verb, the first verb is a present tense verb, who is and who was and who is to come. And then I am the alpha and the omega that God's, the all encompassing presence of God, particularly in those moments and times when it seems that God is not this all encompassing presence and power is really an important claim, I think, on Reign of Christ Sunday. That's key. I, 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 I wanna add verses to Revelation. And I'm going to make a big jump and do Revelation 5, 5 through 6 as well, uh, where, where Jesus first appears to John the Revelator. And we're told that only the lion can open the seal. Right? John's weeping because nobody's strong enough to open the seal on the scroll. And he's reassured the lion is going to do this. And then he sees, and see, uh, sees a lamb that was slaughtered, standing as if it had been slaughtered is one of the translations of that. Um, that this is who it is, that when you, you're expecting strength, you're expecting something you know fierce that rules by intimidation, you see whatever a lamb slant, standing as if it had been slaughtered is supposed to look like. And that's the, the appearance, so to speak, uh, of Jesus. So how John plays around with some of those images and subverts them and even surprises you uh, with that one as well. <laughs> 